If you are here and don't have a Bible, I believe there are, is at least one Bible in every pew section, so feel free to grab that. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 21. The Bible says here, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Today I'd like to talk on this subject. We've been doing this little mini-series on the importance of the church, and I'd like to share with you today the church as the bride of Christ. And so let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to be still in these few moments together as we open up thy word, look at what it has to say, and Lord, may we listen May we be obedient servants. I desire, Father, to not give my words at all. I want this to be you speaking. And so pray, Lord, I, I, I step out of the way. I hide behind the cross. I have nothing to offer but the word of God and Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'd use me today in a special way to help deliver this message to and I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. There were some children that were gathered together on a rainy day within a particular home, children all, all of the neighborhood, and they're playing their toys, and one day, or, or in a period of time, they kind of got tired of playing the toys, so they decided to use their imagination, and they put their imagination together that they wanted to put together a mock wedding. So one of the children decided to be a flower girl. One young boy decided to be a ring bearer. There was the bride, the father of the bride. And yes, one six-year-old boy stood up there in the front of the room. He was the preacher. Everything went so well with the imagination as it came to life. That ring bearer walked down the aisle, and he had some little makeshift ring. And the flower girl spread out her pretend flowers the little boy acting in the stead of the father of the bride walked the bride down their make-believe aisle, and they stood before that six-year-old boy who was the preacher. And they just stood there and waited for that little preacher to say something. And one of the boys finally said, say a verse, say a verse. Well, he couldn't remember any verse except for this one. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, truthfully, marriage is an interesting thing when you bring two people together in what we call holy matrimony. I have performed a lot of weddings, and I have found it quite interesting to be involved in the aspect of two people coming together. I enjoy weddings. I enjoy being there. I enjoy the aspect of performing the weddings. But truthfully, one of the most interesting weddings that I have ever performed, actually, is the last wedding I just did just last year. It was a wedding that uh, actually I was asked to consider. Uh, some folks that had attended our church in the wintertime said, Preacher, there's somebody who needs someone to do a wedding for them. Would you do it? And I said, well, my first stipulation is I need to be sure that they knew, know Christ as their personal Savior. So I set up a meeting with them. They lived in Port Charlotte, and uh, we met at McDonald's. And so we met there. 
Uh, we had uh, just, uh, I had a coffee, it was in the early part of the evening, and so we talked, and they gave their testimony of salvation. I shared with them, I'd like to do some counseling, and they agreed. And so two of the four counseling sessions, we actually met there at McDonald's, and we had a wonderful time together, and then came the day for the wedding. What a beautiful day it was. In fact, it was held on Boca Grande there on Banyan Street. I mean, you have ever been to Boca Grande? You've seen the Banyan Tree Street there, and what a beautiful sight, beautiful place for a wedding. And I'll tell you, everything was so nice except this was August, and it was hot. I'm telling you, it was hot. But I stood there, I performed the wedding. And everything went just fine, and then the reception afterwards. And I always prepare the bride and the groom. I always ask them, be sure to get your wedding certificate together. And at the ceremony, I'll sign it. We'll get the best man and the maid of honor to go ahead and sign it as witnesses, and I'll be sure to help you send that off. Well, that day, they had forgotten everything, had not gotten it. I said, I'll tell you what, you just call me when you're ready, and we'll sign it. Two and a half weeks went by, and I, I just all of a sudden happened to remember, and they called me. They said, Preacher, can we meet you tonight? We've got to get this signed. We're both heading to Jamaica. We've got to go back there now for a few months. And they were heading back to that area, and they said, Can you meet us tonight to sign a certificate? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll clear my schedule. We'll make it happen. So there we meet at McDonald's. I sit at the table. On the one side is the newly married couple. On the other side is the, uh, the best man and the maid of honor. And they came to join in with this to help sign. And I grabbed the certificate. And I looked at it, and it was from the wrong county. Many of you may not realize this, but most of Boca Grande is actually located in Lee County. They had grabbed a Charlotte County marriage certificate. And when I looked at it and I said, I'm so sorry, this is the wrong one, I'll tell you what, tears started coming down her eyes. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. We're sitting in McDonald's in Charlotte County. I said, would you be opposed if I went ahead and just did the wedding vows here right now? <laughs> she looked at me, the tears, she kind of wiped the tears away. She said, really, you can do that? <laughs> sure I can. I said, we got the best man, maid of honor as witnesses. I said, we can gather. We got a few other people eating here. We can have them come over and join us. <laughs> so I went out to my car. I got my computer. I set that up on the table, and I read the vows to them there, and they said those vows in front of those two witnesses. The most interesting wedding I've ever done. We got a milkshake for the reception afterwards. It was great. <laughs> But I think the most interesting thing that happened on that day with that little wedding and that little reception was that husband looked at me and he said, do you mean that I could have saved all this money and we could have had that right here? <laughs> yes. Yes. So those of you that are looking to get married, I can do one at McDonald's for you and it is very inexpensive. But you know what's interesting about this passage of Scripture? And I love this passage of Scripture when it talks about the husband and the wife and the roles that they have. But I want you to see something very clearly in verse number 32, because Paul lets us in on a statement, and he helps us get an understanding of really the truth that he's trying to drive home. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery. What is a mystery? Well, a mystery in the Bible is something that you did not know before, but now I'm giving you this information. And what is that mystery? He says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Do you realize that as you read through Ephesians chapter 5 and you see the role of the husband and you see the role of the wife, that all of that is a picture of, of what Jesus' relationship is to us as the church. We here today who are saved that represent the church are really representing the bride of Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect groom. And what a wonderful relationship that is brought together here 
And when you and I understand some things about that relationship as a believer, as a part of the church, and we can understand that relationship, it'll transform our thinking with regards to the church, but it'll also transform our thinking when it comes to our marriages. I must say today that when I read these roles in Ephesians chapter 5, there are so many today, and I'm talking just in Christian circles who say, Preacher, we live in this day to day. Come on, the Bible's antiquated when it talks about these roles. I'm going to tell you something. God knew what he was doing when he asked the husband to lead and when he asked the wife to submit to that leadership. Now, that's, you're, it's a little quiet in here. Because I know I'm in a group of people here and I'm in a society that likes to twist everything and put it upside down. And can I give you a piece of information when you read the Bible? It is imperative that you put aside all of the societal norms, that you set aside everything that the society is trying to tell you, and you take the Bible for what it says. Amen. Don't interpret society's norms into the Scripture. Take the Bible and begin to interpret what you need to do for your life. Amen. And so how important it is. But let's get into this aspect here in regards to the relationship of the church known as the bride of Christ. There's three things that I just want to highlight from this passage of Scripture. Number one, I see that you and I are given security in Christ. We are given security in Christ. I want you to mark the words in verse number 23 where it says about Jesus that he is the Savior of the body. There's a couple of things to note here about this particular phrase and this aspect of Jesus as a Savior of the body. The first thing to, that, to see is that the reason this relationship is made possible with Jesus Christ is due to the fact that Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins, and he initiated this relationship with him. Have you ever wondered for just a moment why it is that they call the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the suffering that he went through as the passion of Christ? Now, some of you might say, well, I I've never really looked at it that way. And, and, uh, but, but truthfully, when we think about all that Jesus went through, Leading up to the crucifixion, the crucifixion, the death on the cross, and his burial, every bit of it is a passion. The word, the Latin word uh, for passion means to suffer. And the idea of all this is that you and I understand that Jesus Christ was passionate enough to come to this earth to die on the cross that you and I could have a relationship with him. Jesus laid his life down for the church. He utterly gave himself for us. And you talk about the ultimate expression of love. That's how Jesus brought the church into being. Without the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no church. And so it's powerful to see here the fact that Jesus has brought into us into this relationship. But I note something else about this phrase, the Savior of the church. And that is that Christ gave himself not only to save us, but he is the protector of us. He is a natural protector that is bound to anticipate and provide for the needs of the body of Christ because he's given his life for us. Can I say to you that every believer that places himself in Jesus Christ has placed himself under the protection that God provides through his son, Jesus. Amen. Just as a married woman will place herself under the protection of her husband, so it is that you and I as a church are in that relationship and we are nurtured and protected and guarded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ has pledged himself to you to protect you from every enemy that you have. Often the powers of hell have tried to put down the church, but I'm here to remind you Jesus has not abandoned the church. 
No weapon that is formed against the church has ever been allowed to prosper, and there'll be no weapon that ever will be for performed that can take down the church. Never will the Lord Jesus forget his relationship to us and leave us unprotected. Wow. That's what Jesus did. Now, I think about when I first got married. I remember when I proposed to my wife, and I thought, and I told her, I said, if you marry me, I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. Now, honestly, I was a poor college student. I couldn't even pay my school bill. But yet I told her, I'll protect you. I'll meet your needs. And I tell you, we got married and, and we walked through life. And, and uh, that dear lady there placed herself in my arms, if you will, and trusted me to provide for her. And it's been a scary ride that she's been on ever since. 30 years this year, it's been a scary ride. But I want to tell you something. Just as a wife will place herself under her Savior, if you will, that husband who will be there to protect her, to make sure that her needs are met, to make sure that everything is fulfilled, can I say to you, Jesus Christ is a Savior of the body. You see, it makes coming to church a whole lot more than just sitting down, plopping on the chair, and then just kind of listening to a sermon and going out. If you understand something, that there is a potent relationship that you have with Christ, that Jesus is here to protect you, to help you. Some of you today are dealing with things in your life. You're dealing with a lack of assurance of salvation. Can I say Jesus is here to meet your needs in that area? Some of you are going through a trial in your life right now, and you're wondering how you're going to make it, and you're looking for answers to life situations out in the world. Can I say Jesus is the Savior of the body? He's there to help you. Why you come to church and why you fellowship with others, it is because in this collective thing known as the bride of Christ, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find in Christ our protection. Amen. What a beauty to know Jesus as Savior. But number two, I want you to notice this, and that is that we are subject to Christ we are subject to Christ. Please note the word in verse 22, the word submit. And please observe in verse number 24, the word subject. The word submit or this idea of subjection literally means to place oneself under, to arrange myself in such a way that I put myself in the proper spot. Now, the reason we have difficulty with such a word like submit is that we think today of some of the men in the world who have not provided such good leadership. There have been men who have been very selfish and sinful. There have been others who have been cruel and spiteful. Let me just say, we've had a little baby say amen. It's okay that you say amen, all right? Yeah. Honestly, it's okay. Just let it happen, all right? I mean, if it sounds like that, it's okay, but just amen, all right? But I want to tell you something. Though we've had men in, the church, in, in society who have not done such a good job in their leadership role, that doesn't describe the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus comes as the head of the church, and he has provided that beautiful servant leadership. Jesus has led me and loved me, and in all of his leadership in my life, he's never forced anything on me. Can I say to you, you've never met such a more wonderful gentleman than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He'll never force anything on you. He'll never make you do it out of compulsion. He'll come out of his grace and his mercy, and he'll lead you. And you'll find that you'll want to follow and submit to that leadership. Now, I believe our reticence towards this idea of submission today is worldwide. 
But I want to quote a verse to you that I think will help us understand this aspect, not only in the home, husband and wife, but also within the context of the church. Let me read the verse in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. It's also given by the Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians 5. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Amen. Now, that seems a little different to us. Because when we think in our world about the Trinity... We think of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We often say that they are co-equal. So how is it that a verse like 1 Corinthians 11, 3 can say that God is the head of Jesus here who is the Son? Does it mean that the Son is inferior to the Father? No. The Apostle Paul also told us in the book of Philippians that the Son of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So therefore, in the eternal love that God had, in that eternal headship that the Father had, He provided that love and He's showing to us here today that within the context of the Trinity, when God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yes, they're co-equal, but every Every one of them has a role to fulfill. Amen. And the Father, along with the Son and along with the Holy Spirit, cre uh, brought a plan together to save you and I from our sins. And the Son of God submitted to the Father and gave his life to die on the cross. Amen. Jesus Christ, who is every bit God, is not inferior. He is equal with God the Father, but yet he submitted himself to the very will and fulfilled it for us. May I say to you today that as the church of Jesus Christ, we ought to submit ourselves to the leadership of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. You say, how do I submit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I want you to think about this. When you and I come and we worship together, you know what we're saying as we sing these songs? We're submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I watch some of you as you sing. It's interesting. You ought to come up here and join me sometime. But truthfully, when it comes to singing, why do we do this? Because our singing is an expression of our heart to the Lord. And you think of the words that are being sung, that we're letting the Lord know how he is first in our lives, that we're giving glory to him, that there's none other like God, how great is our God. And all of these things are coming forth from us. And singing is an act of worship. Now, there's some of you that don't sing because right now you're here today and your allegiance is to this world. It's not to Jesus Christ. And the reason you don't sing is because Jesus doesn't have first place in your life. And I want to encourage you, singing is one of the greatest things we can do as a believer. Yeah. You say, well, preacher, I got a lousy voice. It's okay. Just give a nice loud call and praise to the Lord because I want to tell you something. Someday when we get to heaven, we're going to be singing for all eternity. Amen. So you might as well start practicing right now Amen. and getting yourself prepared for being up there. But what other ways are we submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ in listening to him and obeying his voice? Yes. Yes. Now, you've heard me say this many times. As I come and I preach the word of God, and I want to remind you that we have services here Sunday morning. We have services on Sunday night. We have services on Wednesday night. Every service is different, but it is afforded an opportunity for you to hear the word of God. But when I share the word of God or someone else shares the word of God, it is not just to make you smarter. Now, you may come to church and you may learn something you did not know before, but that is not the whole thrust of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You know why God gave His Word? You know why the Word of God is being spoken right now? Is so you can hear what is being said as the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and you have one choice to make today. You either say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you in this matter, 
or Lord, I'm going to just keep going the direction I'm going. And I want to tell you today that the beauty of church is to be able to submit to that headship. Amen. Not to a preacher, not to a group of deacons, not to a group of leaders within the church, but ultimately all of us here together, together as a bride of Christ, are submitting to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We express our submission to God when we pray. Whether you pray as an individual, whether we pray collectively. You know what praying is? Praying is coming to God and saying, God, I can't fix this, but I know you can. That's submission. How many prayer requests have you come before God and thought to yourself, well, I'm going to pray it because I just know I ought to, but I think I can kind of fix this problem. If you think that, you're, you're off your rocker. Because truthfully, whether it comes for sickness, whether it comes for spiritual needs, whatever the prayer request is, as I get alone before God and I bring that request up to Him, I am literally saying to God, help me. It's an acknowledgement that I need God's help and I'm submitting to His authority. Oh, I could go on and on here today, but we're given security in Christ and salvation. Jesus, the bridegroom, is head of the church, the bride, and the church must willingly and joyfully submit to that authority. But number three, I want you to see this. We are sanctified by Christ. Amen. We're sanctified by Christ. I want you to see here in this point that there is a purpose in Jesus saving us. There's a purpose in us submitting ourselves to him, and it's our sanctification. Look with me beginning here in verse number 26. Why did Jesus love us? Why did he give his life for us? Well, verse 26, the purpose is that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, that he, that he not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And the reason is that it should be holy and without blemish. I want you to look at this one word here in verse number 26. It is the word sanctify. Now, the word sanctify is related to a word that we use, a theological word, is the word sanctification. Now, some of you may have never heard that word before, but literally in theological terms, in biblical terms, this word sanctification is closely related with the word holy. You see, God saved you not just so you could go to heaven. He saved you so while you walk this pilgrim road, your journey of life, you would live a holy life and would show forth the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is asking you and I, as the bride of Christ, to be holy. Now, through the preaching of the Word of God, that is the washing of water by the Word, that is of the nurture and everything that the Lord Jesus Christ is doing, He's trying to make you holy. He desires that you would live a life that is totally pleasing to Him and that is a wonderful witness and testimony to the world around you. But I guarantee that while you're here in church and you feel like, all right, I can muster up a little bit of holiness because I'm in church, you walk out that building and you start rubbing shoulders with the world and you start seeing things on television and the movies and all the things of our society and you realize how difficult it is to live a holy life. You know what's sad about the church of Jesus Christ at large? Is the church has failed to live up to the measure and the standard of holiness. We have far too many Christians that are talking more about the movies today than talking about Scripture. We have far too many that are interested in the latest television shows and the things that are going on out of Hollywood than they are out of the things that are from straight from heaven, from God Himself. And my friend, I want to tell you something. If you want to understand the church and the value and importance of the church, begin tuning out the things of this world and start tuning into the things of God. Amen. 
and you'll see what God has for you. Some of you say today, well, preacher, you know, look, I, I, I'm saved and stuff, and, and, and I, I, I want to be like Christ, but I, I just don't want to be one of those weird Christians, you know, as if I know what that means. Can I say something to you? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. I'm part of the group. Come join me. Can I say that if you live a holy life, you will stand out. You see, there's too many Christians today that say, oh, preacher, I don't, I don't want to stand out too far from the crowd. Let me just tell you something. You start naming Jesus, you start living a holy life, and you won't even have to ask about standing out. You will stand differently. Don't buy into the whole philosophy that I got to be like them to win them. That is a statement from the pit of hell. God's asked us who are in the world to not be like the world and to stand fast in the things of God. Oh, I want to say today that if we're going to be sanctified before Christ, then the church is going to be innocent before the Lord. There cannot be any sin in the camp. As the light of God shines through the house, the closets are open, nothing's hidden. There's no secret things. No closed books before God. We ought to walk as children of light. There ought not to be in the Christian any filthy talk, silly talk, profanity. Instead of all those things, the life of a Christian in his mouth ought to be filled with words of grace. The godly bride of Jesus Christ is innocent of gossip and slander. There are no words and should be no words which the bride of Christ speaks to insult, to tear down, to defame others. Our job is to help build one another up. Amen. In all the ways the godly bride is to be innocent, everything should be open and bare before the Lord. We're never going to venture off into a web of deceit. We'll not participate in things of deceit or take from others what is rightfully theirs. We don't act of, out of covetousness. And so therefore, when the bride of Christ is looked at from the world, they ought to see such an honesty, such a purity, such an innocence that they're attracted to it. And I guarantee that when you as a church begin living as Jesus would have you to live, that light will begin attracting folks who are searching for something better. Hallelujah. I cannot tell you as I have walked through this life, and I, I'm not putting myself up as a perfect person, but being involved in church and living a life that is pleasing to the Lord, that has been something that has drawn people to himself who have looked at drugs and alcohol and immorality and everything else to find that pleasure and fill the void. And when they come up empty, they realize there's something better. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. And the testimony that you and I have so important. The goal of Jesus Christ, our groom, is that we would be made holy. Right now, Jesus is working in your life. He's helping you. He's taking some things out that need to be taken out. He's sharpening your life, and he's preparing you for that day that you'll be there in heaven with him. Won't that be a wonderful day? You know, we talk about all that. We talk about heaven, and we talk about those streets of gold and everything that's going to go on up there. But I'm telling you something, that right now, God is preparing you for that glorious day that we'll see him, and we will be like him just as he is. What a wonderful day. So today, in closing, I'd like to ask you this question. Have you accepted the invitation to become a part of the bride of Christ? That is, do you know Jesus personally? Is he your Savior? Have you accepted him today? What are you trusting in to go to heaven? You see, the bride and the groom, the church of Jesus Christ, all those that are saved, 
will be brought together with the groom, there will be a wonderful wedding reception. Right now, we're in the engagement process. Jesus is opening up the invitation to people all over, and praise God, in the last few months, almost 300 people placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and yet there may be somebody here today who does not know that Christ is their Savior, that they're on their way to heaven. Today you can know Him. But if you're part of the bride of Christ, are you living for Him? Is your life pure? Is it innocent before God? You say, preacher, oh my, there's things I've got to, I, I don't even know where to begin. You know what? Just, just start laying things at the altar before God. Just however God speaks to you, just say, God, I'm going to give this to you, and I'm going to go ahead and get an accountability partner, and I'm going to begin working on some things, and I'm going to begin trusting you because I desire to show to the world out there that I belong to you. Do people know in your neighborhood, in your workplace, that you belong to Jesus? I hope they do. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share the word of God. Oh, help us, Lord. We long to see people come to know you as Savior. We long to see Christians who submit their lives to your leadership and help in these areas now. Speak to hearts, I pray. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I, I'm not saved. I, just, just what you were talking about a few minutes ago. I don't know Christ as my Savior. In fact, if I were to die today, I, I can't say for certain I'd go to heaven. Well, may I say to you, based on the authority of the Word of God, this is not my authority, this is not anything of myself or of Calvary Baptist Church, but on the authority of the Word of God, you can know today beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is your Savior. I'd like to invite you to pray a simple prayer. Please understand the prayer, the words don't save you. It's what you say with the heart. You're confessing with your mouth. You're saying a prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, but there has to be something that is from the heart. And I'd like to invite you right now, if you'd like to be saved, to pray this simple prayer. As I pray it out loud in short phrases, I invite you to repeat it to yourself and pray it as unto the Lord. Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. And I know that I can't get to heaven on my own. But I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, and was buried and rose again to become my Savior. And right now I'm asking Jesus Christ, God's holy Son, to forgive me of all my sins and become my personal Savior. Now while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're here today and you say, Preacher, and I'm the only one looking right now. You say, Preacher, I, I prayed that prayer and I meant it. Would you just lift your hand right now? Anyone here today? Preacher, I just prayed that prayer and I meant it. I trust that every person here knows Jesus as their Savior. Christian, I'm talking to you right now. How's your life before God? You're the bride of Christ. Are you being unfaithful to Him? Are you stepping out on the Lord? Are you following into various other things, idols that are in your life? Pleasure, money, activity, everything else is crowding out your relationship with Christ. And today you're brought to this spot. And God's reminding you that it is imperative that he is number one in your life. I want to invite you today that if God has spoken to your heart here today, why don't you come to the front and pray. You could stand at the altar, kneel up front here. There's the front row. Most of it is open and come and pray before the Lord and ask him forgiveness for not having him as number one in your life. 
Maybe some of you are here today and say, Preacher, I, 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 I've been saved, but I need to start getting moving in this Christian life. I need to get baptized. Why don't you come and make it known? We won't baptize you today, but we'll definitely set up a time for that. Maybe you're saved and you've been baptized, but you've never joined a local church and you're not a member anywhere. And to, today, this might be the day for you to step forward and say, you know what? I'm showing my allegiance to Christ and I'm going to be a part of this body of believers. And as you come forward, you make it known to somebody right up front, one of our personal workers, and let them know, I'd like to join. I don't know what the need is in your life. But I didn't preach this here today just so you could be smarter Christians. I preached for transformation. And may God work in our hearts and our lives. I may would say, preacher, today God's spoken to me about something and I need to get it right before him. Would you just lift your hand for just a moment? This is an acknowledgement before God. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else here today? Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. There's some things I need to make right. Lift your hand for just a moment. Anyone else? God bless you. The invitation is for you. The altar is open. Why don't you come lay it before the Lord? Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to pray, and when I say amen, the piano will begin playing. We'll have some personal workers will be right up here. Why don't you come and make decisions for the Lord? Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for what you're doing. I pray that you'd help us. May decisions be made here today, we ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen.